The founding family of Raleigh, North Carolina, built their empire high on the hill of the town, and the legacy they left outlasted any of their mortal lives. Pianos playing on their own, children running when there's no one around, and a house alive with spirits of history and the paranormal. This week's episode is The Mordecai House. A bump in the night, your heart fills with dread. Probably a murderer who wants you dead. It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse. Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse. It's hopeless, you're doomed. You'd call a priest if you could. You'd rather just listen to who? Sinisterhood. I'm gonna kill you. Wait a minute. Where's Teal Swan Part 3? Uh-oh. Don't got worry. The week. Don't worry. Teal Swan Part 3 is coming out next week. We're doing things a little different because we had to release this episode this week because there's some important, fun, paranormal, spooky events going on at the Mordecai House coming up that we want to make sure everybody knows about. So this was a time-sensitive topic that we get out. We made a promise to the Ghost Guild. We did. And what this boils down to is we befriended a group of paranormal investigators, which dream come true, first of all. Mm-hmm. Absolute dream come true. Shout out to the Ghost Guild of North Carolina and their fearless leader, Nelson Naus, who was so kind as to take us on a journey of the Mordecai House, which you'll hear throughout this whole episode. And when we were discussing when we were going to release it, we made uh, our, we're only as good as our word. And we said, we'll release it the week of the 12th because there's a fun event at the Mordecai uh, house, the week of the 12th. And Deal Swan was only supposed to be two parts. <laughs> yep. She got, she's got out of control. Like, so, I mean, so many have seen. I mean, it's not just with us. So she's also for all of us, we cannot talk about her for like a week, right? Yeah. It'll be fine. Yeah. 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 Um, but we will, yeah, we'll get to that. And But we made a promise to the Ghost Guild. And when you make a promise to paranormal investigators, you have to follow through. If you don't, so. they will haunt you after <laughs> they die. That's how it works. Or if we they, die first, then, I don't know. They've, they'll haunt us. They, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's true. Because yeah. they know where we are. They can talk to us. So they'll just come. Either way, we're getting haunted. So yes. we got to make sure... We make good with the Ghost Guild and Nelson, who, like Heather said, was so gracious. We had a great time on our tour that we'll talk about. And then they all came to our show, which also, the reason we're re-recording this, and it's not the episode that we recorded live, is because there were some audio issues. I will say, though, probably the wildest show we've had was Raleigh, North Carolina. So it's a shame that, that... you, not everyone gets to hear that, but that's why you got to come to a live show. Because if you were there and you experienced it, then if you know, you know. Yeah, exactly. We have our outline, but all the jokes we made, and especially the Judge Christie, which got raucous in a discussion Good of Lord, I was booed. <laughs> I was booed twice. Twice. So uh, the audio is gone. Listen, it's not. It's you gone. can't hear it. Sometimes it's rough. things happen. Uh, it's it's a rough thing that happened, and it but it happened to us one time before. So that's why you all got the Kells Irish Pub mm-hmm. studio version versus live version. So this is the same thing. So we're doing studio version because we still want the story to get out there, and uh, because we made a promise to get killed. <laughs> That's what and it boils down to. That's yes. what it boils down to. So here we are. But this is a really great topic mm-hmm. because it deals in not only, obviously, we go into the paranormal ongoings, but also history. And I think we'll discuss a little bit of telling, maintaining uh, history while also making sure that all voices are represented. And I think that the Mordecai uh, house and staff that does the research and the tours there are really good about that too. So I'm really glad that we found this kind of odd little corner of North Carolina that before going on the tour, we were, never would have been introduced to. It's a nice little palate cleanser from the other stuff we've been mm-hmm. discussing, which is quite heavy. And it's uh, it's an adventure we all went on. So we'll be able to 
reminisce. As my mamma would say, you'll feel like you were there. You will, yes. Except hopefully you were enjoying listening to this and you'll feel like you're there in much cooler temperatures. Yeah, it was it's a, it's a, it was it, North Carolina is a sweaty town. Or I guess the whole state, but we were in yeah. Raleigh, sweaty city, at least for it us. Was humid, a lot of trees around, yeah, gorgeous, it's close though. to the water. Mm-hmm. Beautiful place, but it much like uh, we were both in the Midwest this past week. Nearly like died. Walking, nearly walking died. I sweat so much. Nearly died. <laughs> but uh, it was worth it because my brother got married and it was Congrats. a beautiful wedding and we had so much fun. First time taking the kids on a plane. Won't happen again for a while. <laughs> first time? Last time. <laughs> Might be last time. Might have been first and last time at the same time. But we, uh, we're we all back now. We all made it. Tommy and I gave us, uh, each other a high five. When we pulled into the driveway, we were like, we did it. Because <laughs> there were some <laughs> moments there that we weren't sure we were going to make it. Yeah. Yeah. I felt bad because y'all was on vacation in Chicago just bumming around. And you text me, here are a series of things that have gone wrong. And you're like, how's Chicago? And I said, I hesitate to tell you because it's great. <laughs> I'm glad you were having such a wonderful time. Yeah, but we uh, we both had a nice little we did. couple of days mm-hmm. doing uh, fun and family and and connecting. So the the prior topic slash ongoing current topic was it's it weighs heavily on mm-hmm. I think our our mental health. So it was good to connect with family. And I'm sorry that you had to fly with children, but <laughs> you're back now, so it's okay. You know so what? Go. We've learned some things. So next time it'll go even better when they're in their teens and we go <laughs> with them. We travel with them again. <laughs> Uh, but it was great being with my family, yes. And uh, the wedding was so much fun. And the Union Station Hotel is just wild. It's That's what you said. It's, it's got everything, including this amazing light show that goes on in this on the ceiling that is very cool. So if you're from the St. Louis area or you've been to this hotel in the surrounding little boardwalk area, you know what I'm talking about. Oh, I forgot to tell you about the Koi Pond. And when I say pond, uh, it's a body of water. My mom was like, we're down by the koi pond. So I'm roaming around this hotel looking for, a, you know, what you would think is in like someone's backyard. Like a, a small yeah. little pond. I see this lake and I'm like, okay, well, maybe the koi pond's over by that. Little did I know, that was the koi pond. The koi's in this. Were they just like... dude? I mean, meaty. You could get food to feed them. So when people would walk up to the edge to feed them, they would all climb on top of each other. It was as if, if you wanted to body surf, if you, if I dove from the side and was like, Koi's, you got to catch me. You, I'm body surfing. I could have just landed on a layer of Koi's and probably not have sunk. I feel like the you didn't say that they have very muscular arms that they then hold you up, but I'm imagining that they, <laughs> they are. They were very muscular things, and they get get on top of each other when they're trying to get the food. It was so many. And then Ella goes, "How big do you think the biggest one in here is?" I was like, "I don't think we've seen it. I think it stays at the bottom and <laughs> just as mm-hmm. it, as its it little lurks. minions bring it food." Yeah, but uh, it was very cool. So. Glad to be home for a while and glad to bring you all this episode. Please enjoy. Well, I'm Christy. (laughs) I'm Heather. And (laughs) please enjoy and let's get into it. (laughs) Called. One of Raleigh's four most important places, historically speaking. The structure now known as the Mordecai House was built originally in 1785 by Joel Lane, making it seven years older than the actual city of Raleigh, which was founded in 1792. Known as the father of Raleigh, Lane was a member of the General Assembly who lobbied for the creation of Wake County. After building the mansion on Mimosa Lane, the home was later gifted to Joel's granddaughter, Margaret Lane, and her husband, Moses Mordecai. Moses was described by a fellow lawyer as one of the best and most successful lawyers who ever appeared before the courts of the state. Well, we uh, have to address Mordecai Mordecai. Yes, yes. Uh, so we're saying it the right way, the way that this family says it, but it's traditionally people would say Mordecai. And while we were walking down the street in Wrigleyville on our way to see a very funny improv show called Portal Prov, 
Par- we passed a place that's called the Mordecai, I think. And Paris said, Mordecai, I think I've heard of that. I said, yeah, it's a sinister topic. We talked about it. I made you watch documentaries on it like months ago. He was like, oh, that's why. And I was like, FYI, it's not Mordecai. It's, it's, it, it's, so was it a different place? Oh, yeah. It was not affiliated okay, with the North okay. Carolina family. So most family. people do say Mordecai because it is yes. M-O-R-D-E-C-A-I. Yes. And we will get into kind of why... Yes, it was changing changed. of that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that was, it was uh, very funny that he was like, oh, I recognize that. It's, like, it's stuck in one. his head. It's stuck in his head, though. That's nice. It's, it's trendy. Originally born in New York City in 1785, Moses moved with his parents, Jacob and Judith Mordecai, to North Carolina in 1792. It was here Moses received an education mostly from his family, eventually obtaining his license to practice law in 1807. And that's how it was. You didn't. You don't have to go to law school. No, you just got to have a relative who's a lawyer who also didn't go to law school. They just became. They just declared themselves. I declare bankruptcy. You just <laughs> declare yourself a lawyer, and then that self-declared lawyer teaches other lawyers, and then all of a sudden you can just be a lawyer. That's how it is. Is that that's how you their, got to be a lawyer? It was, it was loose. Did Nancy no, just teach charged, you how to be were, a lawyer? Yeah, they were charging. It wasn't anybody in my family. I don't know. Mm, I don't think there's anybody in my family I'd listen to on how the law works. I think I would go to Nancy McKinney's School of Law. <laughs> I would like to be a graduate of there. You're going to... Man, she she's like... I don't know that my mom would have the School of Law. It'd be like the School of Justice. Yes, that's true. <laughs> Ooh, be like, Nancy McKinney's yeah, School of Justice. I want a degree <laughs> on my wall from there. School of Justice. <laughs> The Mordecais were an Orthodox Jewish family and originally pronounced their last name Mordecai. After moving to Raleigh, the family changed the pronunciation to Mordecai. Aaron Campo, director of the historic sites for the city of Raleigh, told the Raleigh Public Record that the reason for the change in pronunciation is unclear. We don't know for sure. I've been transcribing letters from the archive. I've talked with descendants who live here. I've talked with descendants who moved down to Georgia who still pronounce it like that to this day. While the pronunciation seems to vary depending on who you ask, Campo concedes that what is generally believed but not confirmed by any primary source is that Moses was maybe trying to make his name sound a little less Jewish. And that, I mean, it would have been a concern back then because he was the first Jewish person to live in Raleigh, Mm -hmm. we learned on our tour, and the first Jewish attorney to pass the bar. Mm -hmm. And practice uh, in the state of North Carolina. Mm-hmm. So his family, there's a book that's called Mordecai, I believe. It's just a singular name, but I think Emily Bloom is the author. And she traced back the lineage of this family. And they were part of a well-established, thriving Jewish community in New York. There was another in Philadelphia. And his family kind of asked him, you know, we have this established community. You have this essential social safety net, right? Mm-hmm. You need a job. We probably know somebody that can help. You need clients if you're a lawyer. But... Moses was hell bent on blazing his own path. And I think with that comes a little difficulty when you're going into the South. Sure. And they're like, what's your last name again? And you're like, mm. and it's sad that you had to make that change yeah. to assimilate. And I don't think that was uncommon. Yeah. Try to blend in and hide mm-hmm. who you are just for safety. Moses and Margaret married in 1817 and had three children together, Henry, Ellen, and Jacob. Sadly, their marriage would be a short one. In 1821, Margaret died, leaving Moses to marry her younger sister, Anne Willis Nancy Lane, in January of 1824. Just nine months later, in September 1824, Moses also died after contracting malaria. A month later, he and Nancy's daughter was born. Nancy named her Margaret in honor of her dearly departed sister. Yeah. So this was very interesting. And of course, everyone bristles when you're like you just married her sister she was barely Mm -hmm. in the grave but our lovely tour guide when we um toured the mordecai house explained to us that back then marriage wasn't what we think of it today it wasn't necessarily about love it was about property and maintaining your property and wealth and keeping it within the family so it was all just transactional it wasn't really romantic or you know i mean obviously they're doing what they need to do to have kids but i think there was you know um it wasn't like romance and love was the top priority it was more we got to make sure that 
ev- all of our wealth and everything stays in one family. Oh, yeah. And if the ho- because the house itself came from the Lane family, which would have been Margaret's family, and then she died. Right. And then you have this family going, our former son-in-law is living in our house. And he's like, nay, nay, I'm now your current son-in-law again, <laughs> for I have married the other daughter. Exactly. And they're like, all righty then. Okay, so I see what it- you did there. <laughs> and also, the names... There's a, there's gonna there's a lot of Margarets there's a lot of Marys there's a lot of Moseses there's like they all, so which you know, Margaret was that you have a thousand people and three names is how it went yeah. back there yeah that's I mean they did what they could <laughs> <laughs> Moses left a substantial inheritance to his new wife in his will the will deemed that Nancy used the funds to build a great house instead she decided to expand the house she already lived in throughout the next two years. Architects added on a neoclassical facade, plus four front rooms and halls. And we, you can see this when you actually visit it, what used to be the smaller portion of the house, and then she had this huge, what now looks like the front, was all built on extra. And I like that of like, I'm bequeathing you this money to do this thing. And she's like, nah, I'm going to do my own thing. I have Also, I'm idea. bequeathing you this money. Do you mean my family's money that you only have because you married into it and I'm a woman and I don't have rights? Also that. I'm going to do what I want. Thanks. She also did a huge flex and had the whole house painted yellow, which we learned was a very rich color. It meant you were very wealthy because the only way you could get it was shipping it in from India. So Mm -hmm. if you had yellow, it meant that you had a lot of money because you could get that shipped on over here. You can afford it. And the house is up kind of on a hill. So people in the town, not only you look up and see this giant house, but you look up and see this giant flex yellow. yellow it's house, not just yeah. yellow. It's flex yellow. <laughs> um, that they, yeah. and That's going to be the, the Pantone house. color of the year. Flex yellow. <laughs> That's what I want. The whole house. Head to toe, flex yellow. Mm-hmm. At the height of the Civil War, the Mordecais, then headed by Moses' son, Henry, kept nearly 200 enslaved individuals in bondage on the property making them one of the largest enslavers in North Carolina. Historic sites manager Douglas Porter told the News and Observer, The Mordecai family is important, but a major duty we have as historians is to talk about other people who live there. Enslaved individuals way outnumbered the Mordecai family. With the Emancipation Proclamation, the enslaved individuals who once lived on the Mordecai land were granted their freedom in 1863. In 2015, the city hosted a lecture series to provide more context into what life was like to the people who kept the house running in those days. Porter told The Observer, We want everyone to come here and learn. And that was honestly one of the best parts of the whole tour Mm -hmm. was having Jordan, our tour guide, give context, important context to you know, quotes, versions of history that were written out by Mordecai family members that were contradicted by the lives and stories of enslaved individuals living there. And she told the whole story of Sally, who was one of, we'll get to another of these descendants, Ellen Mordecai. It was kind of her childhood companion that was a forced companion. For, it was an enslaved individual. She was forced individual. to be friends with Ellen Mordecai. Yes. They they bought a child and mm-hmm. gave it to their child and said, this is your playmate, friend, whatever you want it to be. It's not like Sally had the the ability to say, no, thank you. I don't mm-hmm. want to play with you. And then later on with the Emancipation Proclamation, when they were granted freedom, some stayed, you know, like we said, it stayed and began getting paid for their mm-hmm. work while others were ready to leave. And Sally was one of those ready to leave. And Ellen Mordecai was like, you don't want to stay here and hang out with me. And she's like, fuck, no, I don't No, I haven't went into this whole time. I was forced to, but it was so interesting. And to hear two different sides of the same coin, you know, you hear the white woman's version and then the enslaved individual. And you're like two very different experiences, which I'm like you said, it's, wonderful that they aren't leaving that out you know for a long oh, time no, people would just brush that under the rug and say look at this beautiful yellow house isn't this so historical and cool it's like sure but a lot of stuff went on there that we need to talk about and is also a huge part of the history and story so all of that needs to be shared at the end too they gave us printed out um, sheets of, uh, I believe, was it poetry written by some of the enslaved individuals? It was it was like uh, first-person interviews. That's what by, it was, yes. Mm-hmm. 
And they also just saying this wealth would not have existed mm-hmm. when you once they started having to pay formerly enslaved individuals, they couldn't keep up. They couldn't keep up with the bills and just having that uh, context to the whole story of it's not just look at our beautiful, wonderful history. And Ellen Mordecai wrote a whole book about her family's history and said, I don't want to talk about any of the sad things. Mm. Well, well, isn't that good for, <laughs> yeah. good for you? What a privilege you You can just have. cherry pick mm-hmm. history. But now we're seeing uh, the more trending towards let's give a holistic view of mm-hmm. how this really this shit really went down. Yeah. And the um, there are some buildings at the Mordecai property that are original and then some have been kind of reconstructed to show what it would have looked like but the um I, I hesitate to call it a kitchen the smoker the sm- the smoker mm-hmm. house was right next to the the big house and Jordan said you know that's where certain enslaved individuals would have to prepare all of the food for the whole day granted it is not uh, nothing is air conditioned, even of course, you know, where the Mordecai sleep, everything is just, you open a window and you hope for a breeze, but to be in this small little smoker house all day in the North Carolina heat, and then you're taking that to someone else. You're not getting to eat any of that. The way they, um, they were set up and treated, uh, and apparently, uh, was it Henry? Was, yeah, is uh, was a real real piece of shit. Yeah, he was, and he of course Henry Mordecai is one of his giant ass portraits yes. looming over. But then again, that's back then there was all these like fully painted portraits. That was the mark of I think. In, in addition to having flex yellow housing, you also had to have a scowling portrait of yourself mm-hmm. where you're like, "Welcome to my home." But he, I mean, just the it, additional scowling. I mean, he looks worse, and he is the one that. Ellen Mordecai said, I can't really write a lot about him. Because I'm not putting I only... sad stuff in. Yeah. I don't want to put it. I don't want to bum everybody out. Yeah. Because Henry Mordecai was, an, uh, he was not, a a, not a nice yeah. guy. But that's the that that's the nature of the, the story that, that when you don't leave it out, you're like, yeah, there were not everybody was happy, shiny. No. In fact, m- most weren't. In 1858, Henry's daughter and Moses's granddaughter, Mary Willis Mordecai, was born in the house. She would make the house her home after marrying railway executive William Turk in the house's parlor. Mary and William's children were all born in the upstairs bedroom at the home. Though she died in 1937 after suffering a cerebral hemorrhage, it is said that Mary never really left the Mordecai house. And Mary Willis Mordecai, so William Turk, and she got married, and then he moved off and they had their first kid. And then he had her committed to an asylum... Mm. Because, quote, she was filled with rage. Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe it's because she just had a newborn and she's all by herself. Yeah. And she was uh, taken from her. You know, the, the, they live with family, cousins, uncles, everybody. You know, everybody was kind of in this nearby area and he moved her off. And then when she was committed to this asylum, which when we did the, is it the Trans Allegheny Asylum, mm-hmm. what, where they listed all the reasons why they yes. threw women. And one of them was like reading too reading much. Reading too much. Yeah. Cry sometimes. Yeah. And this, this was filled with rage. Her sisters came, rescued her from the asylum and brought her to the Mordecai house, back to the yellow house on the hill. At some point William must have visited because that, that's what the tour guide said because they had a second kid. Yeah. But that he never re- returned to the house. She then lived in the house and raised the kids in the house and he lived his life wherever he lived his life at, which I imagine uh, you probably don't want to reconcile with your spouse after they had you locked up for mm, just getting upset. Yeah. And I imagine that would fill me with more rage. So yes. yeah, it's just an endless cycle. And his was the one that his picture is, it's him as a baby that's in that room. Yes. And it, and it's, uh, we I believe we called it a demon baby. It does, it's, does um, look like a demon baby. There are also a lot of, what I'm going to say are haunted dolls throughout the whole <laughs> whole house. In fact, the, the nursery is filled with them and they are quite disturbing. And they're all original. Some of them are, are kind of cool because you see like what people had to make dolls with like they're just made from corn husks and rags and then there are some porcelain ones and those are definitely cursed they oh yeah you can't have they absolutely get up and walk around when no one's there at night you know their heads are moving Mm -hmm. when we were on so it was 
us and Leanne went to meet with Nelson from the Ghost Guild to go on a public tour. And then Nelson was going to supplement our tour. And so we meet with Jordan, our tour guide, and we go into the first house on the tour and uh, about uh, halfway through the first discussion of one of the, you know, it's a park, so it's multiple buildings. Two random tourists just join mm-hmm. our crew, not knowing that we're there kind of on a more ghosty thing. They were just like stoked about history. So then when we went into that, I don't know if you remember this, but we went in that room and we were like, you're like, these dolls are cursed. We're like, look at these fucked up dolls. The lady, it's a couple, it was a man and a woman. And the lady goes, I'd love a photo of these dolls. My mother collects dolls just yes. like yeah. these. I was and like, your mother... Like, how long ago did she die? Because we all know that this is some kind of uh, you got a psycho situation. She mother collects dolls. She's just up in the attic in a rocking chair. She's showing just printed out photos to a, a skeleton with a wig on it. Oh. Look at the photos from North Carolina, mother. <laughs> In 1867, Henry donated a plot of land to the city of Raleigh to be used to establish the county's first Hebrew cemetery, according to the Raleigh National Park Service. Family members that had died years earlier were exhumed and reburied at the now historic Oakwood Cemetery. After Henry's passing in 1875 at the age of 56, he was buried alongside his family. So I like that even though... He that, you know, the family had to change the pronunciation of their name and everything. They still paid tribute to their roots and their culture and their religion by doing stuff like this. Yeah. And being able to because you are the first Jewish lawyer, not Henry, but his ancestor, you know, the first Jewish lawyer, then you are or you're just the first lawyer who also happens to be Jewish. Then you are now establishing a new community mm-hmm. like you left the already established communities and to come and establish one uh, in this new town. And sadly, having to hide that, you're right. It's at least refreshing that in the future, even though Henry wasn't the best of the mortar keys, mm-hmm. someone was at least able to reclaim that heritage. Yeah. Sinisterhood will be right back. Helix Sleep is a premium mattress brand that provides tailored mattresses based on your unique sleep preferences. The Helix lineup includes 14 unique mattresses, including a collection of luxury models, a mattress for big and tall sleepers, and even a mattress made just for kids. So how will you know which Helix mattress works best for you and your body? Take the Helix Sleep Quiz and find your perfect mattress in under two minutes. Models with memory foam layers to provide optimal pressure relief if you sleep on your side. Models with a more responsive foam to cradle your body for essential support in stomach and back sleeping positions. Plus, enhanced cooling features to keep you from overheating at night, which, goodness gracious, we all need that right now. We need it. I took the Helix Sleep Quiz and I got matched with the Moonlight Lux mattress because I need something that is both soft but also supportive because I sleep on my side and back. So I'm like a switch hitter. You're all over the place. I got the, all over the place. Sunset Lux because I am primarily a side sleeper. And I'll tell you what, every day I was out of town, tour, whatever, I woke up thinking, man, I wish I was waking up in my Helix mattress. There's just nothing that compares to it. When my flight got canceled, I almost cried, not because my flight got canceled, but because I had one night in a hotel, one more night, (laughs) not on my Helix. Not only is this mattress the best I have ever slept on, and that is for real, but the setup was fast and easy. Helix mattresses are delivered in a box straight to your door for free. They also offer a 100-night risk-free trial to try out your new Helix mattress. See how your body adjusts. If you decide it's not the best fit, you're welcome to return for a full refund. Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash creepy. With Helix, better sleep starts now. In addition to the many historic grave sites, the beautiful historic Oakwood Cemetery is also home to a large statue of an angel, affectionately known as the Guardian of Oakwood. Not everyone, however, feels protected by the angel. Located at the grave of Etta Rebecca White, the statue was commissioned by her husband to honor the resemblance of his late wife. The artist especially paid attention to the details to the angel's carved stone eyes. Legend has it that these eyes will follow you as you walk through the grounds of the cemetery. As if that wasn't creepy enough, nighttime visitors to the cemetery have reported seeing the statue fully turn its head. 
the large crack in the marble of the angel's neck confirms the creepy urban legend for some. That's some Doctor Who shit. Yes. You turn your head on the angel and they start to come after you. Mm-hmm. You close no, your eyes. I... Isn't that what it is? Blink. I think that's the name mm-hmm. of that episode. Yeah. Just like the uh, porcelain dolls in the Mordecai house had some cracks. This angel's got a big old crack. We wanted to go see this, but we did not have time. But we have seen many pictures and it's... Good for him for wanting to remember his wife forever and have this very large angel statue erected right next to her grave. That does resemble her. Yeah, it's true love. I think there's nothing more romantic than someone just building a kind of a an effigy to you mm-hmm. or a likeness of you that is looming and legendary and causes people to be afraid of it. That's all I want. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. Like many urban legends, the Guardian of Oakwood is most active on Halloween night. The lore says that at midnight, on October 31st, the angel spins her head 12 times. For those that the Guardian takes a particular liking to, it's said she will flutter her wings as a sign of appreciation. Well, I don't have any plans on Halloween, so... No, I do have plans. I always go trick-or-treating. But if you're in North Carolina, check it out. Check it out. I'd like Other people record some audio. I'd like to know what um, marble wings sound like when they flutter. <laughs> Probably not like a bird. <laughs> yeah. Like a jackhammer. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like c- concrete breaking. Yeah, they're, everyone's like, get out of the cemetery. You're trying to sleep. <laughs> Those damn wings. Although Henry Mordecai passed away in 1875, future generations remained on the grounds of the Mordecai house through the 20th century. Burke Haywood Little, the fifth generation of the Mordecai family, was the last private owner of the mansion. In 1967, the city of Raleigh bought the place for just $60,000. The city also spent $16,000 to buy a warehouse full of Mordecai furniture and goods owned by the Mordecai family, sight unseen. Well, and we learned from Jordan, our tour guide, that after emancipation, when suddenly they had to pay their workers, the Mordecai family lost a ton of their wealth because their wealth was derived from the zero cost labor. And once they actually had to reimburse people, you know, pay people for their labor, they couldn't afford it. So then they had to start selling off parcels and parcels and parcels of land. So what, what was once huge acreage with many, many buildings was shrunk smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until it was it's just this house. And that really shows, I think, the amount of wealth that you derive from. Yeah, it's easy to be an impresario when you don't have to pay any of your right. workers. And you don't have to do anything. You're yeah. forcing hundreds of other people to do all the stuff you don't want to do and you're not paying anybody so you're just uh you have zero overhead yeah the labor is usually one of the biggest costs Mm -hmm. of running a business and you don't have that cost but then when you do you're all of a sudden like my business is failing i wonder why and it's so i i do this is a i think on a macro level but or on a micro level like this one case study but when we zoom out and look at our history and i think america loves to say like we have a lot of very uh it's he's a genius businessman or whatever and it's like if you were really a genius businessman before emancipation a lot of times like no yeah you were just rich that inherited rich that inherited rich that just try not to fuck it up Mm -hmm. and then and if most of the time they did they did like all right maintaining that wealth but then when you see that you actually do have to pay for labor suddenly you're like not a magical businessman anymore so i thought that again that was part of the historical tour that you get, that's not like we had to go digging, you know, dig that up somewhere that the, the society that you know preserves it and the parks department put that on the tour that you go and see whenever you walk through there. And I, I love that addition mm-hmm. because I think you can't just exalt and go, well, we have their house and we preserve it and we just have to, everything they didn't said was wonderful and perfect. It's like, no, these are the people that founded our city. Here's the real truth about mm-hmm. them. This treasure trove then served to furnish the mansion with items. Representing every period from Chippendale to Sheraton through late Victorian. Not everything was perfect, though. Chairman of the Raleigh Historic Sites Commission, Dr. Banks C. Talley Jr., told the News and Observer, It was in deplorable condition and smelled terrible. 
Well, I mean, yeah, I imagine it's in a been in a storage unit. It's like what it's storage wars. You just open that. You don't know what you're <laughs> right. getting. You just, back then sh- we saw actually how um, the Mordecai uh, Moses bathed mm-hmm. in this. <laughs> what was it called? A hat bathtub. It was a little, well, I know you just stood in the tub and the one had the little seat on it. Yeah, this was a fancy one. because, And when we say tub, it looks like if a giant um, tin hat was turned upside down. So you're standing in the part of the hat that would, like the bucket part that would go on your head. And then the rim of the hat is around you. So the water can get filled up maybe a foot and then there's this tiny little thing you can sit on. But the real kicker is people had to stand there with just pitchers of water and just pour it over your naked, dirty ass while mm-hmm. you bathed. And that probably didn't happen often. No. So then you're going and sitting on all that velvet furniture and all that heavy, thick, just, you know, curtains and stuff that nothing was light and breezy. Everything trapped odor and hair and, and dirt and sweat. Yeah. And then you got it locked up in a in a storage unit. It's going to stink when you finally un- unseal that. Yeah. Just a humid city in general. I think everything is just going to be a little damp mm-hmm. when you open it up and go, oh, yeah. We paid, how much did we pay for this? Yeah. And like 16 grand. You're like. All right, I guess it has historical, yeah, historical let's, significance. Let's start it does. Cleaning I mean, it. It, it does. It is fascinating to see the minutia that it, it really, I mean, when you walk through this house, it's like somebody could be living there. You know, somebody oh, from yeah. that era, from the, you know, about the 1800s, mid 1800s, could be living there. And all of, t- to the, the fact that majority of it isn't just some stuff from that era, but like this family stuff from that era is, it, I found it to be fascinating that it was, it also, to me, you're inviting ghosts in, right? Because mm-hmm. people go where their shit's at and all their shit's in there. So yep. the fact that we're going to get to a paranormal shouldn't surprise anyone because you just took a storage unit full of all their crap, put it back where it went, and then you're like, why is there a ghost here? Well, because it looks like you're inviting them. You've set up their bedroom to look exactly how it did when they were alive. Yeah, welcome home, Mary. <laughs> the dining room was especially cool because of the original china that was made specifically for the family. So it was... An original print. It was gorgeous. And they had a menu that had been handwritten at some point by one of the, uh, I think it was the one that wrote the book. Ellen Mordecai. Yeah. And so just to see, you know, even Jordan, when they picked it up, used gloves because it's such delicate paper and we weren't allowed to touch it, of course. But to see something from back then and it be preserved to me is always very cool. Yeah, and that's what and we felt that way when we went through the chapel as well, yeah. and that was mm-hmm. part of something on the side as well, where it's like from that era. And it was built by enslaved individuals, and then mm-hmm. those same enslaved individuals were forced to come to that chapel to worship, but they were forced to stand up in the uh, balcony area, which when you, we say stand. That thing's hitting it maybe your mid thigh. It was not very high. So imagine there's 40 people crammed up there. It's the middle of summer. You get woozy. You you know, you pass out. You're falling forward. You're just toppling over the front. Mm-hmm. And you have to hope that you don't fall forward. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. The the woodwork in that chapel oh, was incredible. phenomenal. Yeah. It, it's master craftsmanship. And to for us to be able to go up and put your hand mm-hmm. on this wood, knowing that hundreds of years ago, I mean, somebody whittled and carved that, there is an electricity to history. For sure. Preservationists were thrilled at the restored mansion. J. Myrick Howard executive director of the Historic Preservation Fund of North Carolina, accepted that not everyone, however, loved the place, telling the News and Observer. Objectively speaking, there are probably a lot of people in Raleigh not familiar with Mordecai, and they couldn't care less. Howard remained unbothered, saying, I think it will become increasingly important over the years. Well, no one told him, but... August 2022, buddy. It'll all be worth it. There'll be a sinister head show about it. No. It was all worth it. Some of the items returned to the house included silverware, engraved with the family monogram, as well as Moses Mordecai's nightcap, which was hung in his original bedroom. 
There was also a large swath of books, some with personalized inscriptions. One volume of Byron poetry included the handwritten message, From Ellen Mordecai to her brother Henry Mordecai, who begged and begged for it until she gave it to him. Damn, she was like, for decades, people will know that you're a little bitch that was yelling at me about my Byron book <laughs> in your face. Uh, but again, this is all this tiny minutia of something down to like a nightcap. I don't know, whatever, whatever anybody thinks about what happens when you die. But like, I think sometimes there can be some energy in objects. And I think when you're putting a bunch of them together, I don't know. Is that how a vortex is created? I think so. It's a welcome mat, a ghost welcome <laughs> uh-huh. mat. After the restoration of the building and antique furniture was complete, the mansion was open to the public in 1972 as part of a historical park. Eventually, the city moved the cabin in which President Andrew Johnson was born to the park to stand alongside the Mordecai Place. An advertisement for the Preservation Society's work on the mansion was released later that year. Made to look like a real estate listing, it read, Plantation Manor House, 187 years old, Lots of extras, Victorian whatnots, Jenny Lynn bookshelves, over 1,000 books, and a few ghosts. This is a listing I would go. I would go to an open house (laughs) if it ends with and a few ghosts. And a few ghosts. I think that's how you get people in in the door. Oh, yeah. Lean in. It was a big ass, maybe half a page, Mm -hmm. full page newspaper ad that I was like, you know what? They're putting it out there. I like that. Called the spookiest spot in town. The Mordecai House received so many requests for paranormal investigators to come conduct research on overnight visits that the city had to create a system. Rather than allowing just any researchers in, paranormal societies had to apply to the city to be the sole official researcher for the house for two years since at a time. Mordecai employee Brian Hoffman told reporters that the multiple crews vying for an overnight visit made sense because... Investigators always say they find energy in our house. I like a place that has standards, and I like that you have to apply. There's an application process. Like, we can't have a bunch of EVP monitors bonking the walls Mm -hmm. in here. We need solid, trustworthy, reliable ghost hunters. that's where the ghost guild comes in. I also like that you're not just in it forever. You you know, you get to two-year stint, like any kind of... um, position of power there Mm -hmm. should be term limits and then we all get to decide again was this working out or not and then if it was you get to continue you can apply again Mm -hmm. but i like a paranormal investigator term limit yeah (laughs) so we everyone gets a chance yes volunteers and employees at the house have experienced various interactions with mary throughout the years they have described a strong female presence hovering over the house accompanied by footsteps laughter and banging doors Terry Jones, former director of the house, told the News and Observer. Mary Willis seems to have a sentimental attachment, a real love for her family home. Well, all her stuff is there, so she doesn't... She's... Is it confusing? Do you think the ghosts are like, oh, how nice. We can go out and do our ghost stuff and come back to, you know, somebody set up our house to make us feel like uh, we were when we were alive. Or do you think they think... Oh, we're still alive because all of our stuff is set up the same. I wonder if it's a Beetlejuice scenario where initially you think you're alive, mm. but then through various interactions, you come to realize you're dead. And then you're like, I'm going to try to haunt him a lot and get him out of here. And then you learn to live together. And that's what we have now with the Ghost Guild is now best friends with the Ghost I like the this. House. I'm going to subscribe to this theory. That's I like my it. theory. In 2002... Ghost hunters from Seven Paranormal Research set up audio, video, and motion devices in Mary's room. Team members patrolled the area searching for ghostly presences. Frustrated at the silence, one investigator said, Well, Mary's stubborn because she will not appear. As soon had this phrase been uttered, the team watched as the brand new batteries in both their flashlights and cameras drained until they died. Dude, Mary Mordecai, don't threaten her because she'll come suck your battery yeah. dry. She's like, yes, I'm here, but I'm busy doing stuff. I'm not just here for your entertainment. Now you don't get to see shit. Yeah, she's like, guess what? I'm going to come dance through the middle of this room <laughs> and you'll capture none of it. That's the best idea as a ghost, though, is to troll the people that are investigating mm-hmm. you. That you don't just go, okay, well, get maybe if they're nice, you may give them a little something. A little bit of EVP, come through the whatever. 
But, man, if they're assholes... Now, I'm not saying these folks were assholes, but if you threaten slash challenge me, oh, I would be like, you're leaving empty-handed. If you insult me, you're walking around in the dark. Let's Bye. see what you capture now. Try not to fall. <laughs> Mordecai director Sarah LeCount told the News and Observer about the ways in which Mary Willis Mordecai Turk makes her presence known, primarily by causing a photograph to fall face down on a piece of furniture after a docent has said something about her. This was a common occurrence, though the staff did not mind, with LeCount saying, We're glad Mary is still with us. I, uh, I'm sure by this point you're all sick of us talking about how much we love the ghost guild, but... <laughs> One of the uh, presumptions is that if you disrespect this photo, this certain photo of Mary that sits out on a you know flat surface, that it sh- it will tump face forward. And our wonderful buddy Nelson said, "I've said some things to that <laughs> photo," and he's like, "And it didn't move." And I was like, "You know what though? Nicest guy. Like you feel Very, like he would yes. never insult a person in his life, but it's like Call of Duty that he's like." Okay, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to say something, and maybe that's why I didn't. She follow knows her, Mary, he doesn't mean it. She, she knows was like, he's he a good heart. Yes, she's like, I can see your true intentions. Instead, I'm just gonna slam this door because he told us yeah. about some yes, some occurrences with um, the locked door. Yeah, the front door. That was definitely one where there's a, or I guess it's the back door in theory. It's the door that leads out to the ki- the outdoor kitchen smoking yes. area, mm-hmm. smokehouse area. That they were saying they had cameras all set up, but they did not happen to have a camera on that door. And that it slammed shut and the deadbolt locked. So it's not just like the window slammed the door shut. When nobody was around, it slammed shut and the deadbolt mm-hmm. locked. So they, and that's another reason why we love the ghost skills. You, you try to do scientific hypotheses right like well how could this possibly happen and he's like we you know we put all these cameras on it tested all these different ways and when you you don't say okay that was a ghost but they say this is something an unexplained phenomenon that we couldn't recreate they try and debunk it before yes. they just jump to the conclusion of paranormal which i Correct. i appreciate he told us another story about how when they were in the chapel they heard what he described as chanting and they tried to recreate it a ton of different ways, including someone driving their car by and blasting music at a certain point. And when it was done like that, they were like, okay, well, this could have been that. But, you know, to have that happened, a car would have had to have been driving by at this exact time, stopped at this exact point, had their windows down, had their music up. So it's possible it might be, you know, everything would have to be just perfect, So, which might make it a little more unlikely. But he was very, with everything, he never once said, yeah, it was definitely a ghost. It was, well, it was something we couldn't explain. Yeah, it was something inexplicable. And also, like, we went through these scientific measures, like these attempts to recreate the possibility. So mm-hmm. I love that. I don't have the attention span to do that. I'd be like, well, was it clearly was a ghost? <laughs> I well, do. maybe we could, like. I'll be like, I will debunk this thing for the next 20 years, and then I'll say. come to the conclusion that I can't explain it. It's like, we got to drive the car by at this speed. I'm not doing all that. You'd be like, we have to test it, test every different song. (laughs) uh, It was probably just a ghost. It's fine. Eventually, the portrait flinging became too much. After Mary's portrait had hurled itself off the wall one too many times, house officials placed it inside a wardrobe for storage and safekeeping. During the hunt in 2002, when investigators were collecting data in the area immediately around her wardrobe, they felt the temperature plummet 10 degrees in a span of just 20 seconds. Just as suddenly as the chill swept in, it swept back out, and the temperature returned to normal. Alongside the temperature drop, two orbs appeared on portraits of Mary in the hallway outside the room. Mm, There's the demon baby portrait in her room, which is of her husband that had her committed, frequently, not frequently, but on multiple occasions has also flown off the wall my theory is, baby or not, if a picture of the man that had you committed to an asylum is hanging up in your room in this life or the afterlife, you have every right to knock mm-hmm. that shit on the ground. Yes. Knock it over. And it's it's even creepier that it is baby him. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, we got to put it somewhere. And she's like, take the motherfucker down. <laughs> They're like, nope. We love it. So that is, uh, it's, 
I think it works with the design. I'm not like a historical interior designer, but an old 1800 house, creepy ass old baby portrait, it all works in there. But if she doesn't like it, I think the cute the, the clue is if she's not going to down, you got to go in there and be like, "What do you want us to do with this?" And don't say burn it because we need to keep it for history. <laughs> and maybe it's put it in a different room yes. and then put a picture of her in there or something. Yeah, honor her instead of the man that had her committed. Absolutely. There is a picture of her in there, though, and I uh, well, I have photos. We weren't allowed to take video, but I do have photos, so uh, we'll upload the photos. We'll mm-hmm. share them on Patreon with you all. And there is a photo, I think it's of her. She looked, she looked pretty badass. So oh, yeah. it was one of those where you look at it and you're like, yeah, I can see. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sinisterhood will be right back. They say that hair care is the new skin care, but there is one brand that is taking it to the next level. With a devoted following, Kitsch has created game-changing essentials that beauty enthusiasts swear by. Started in 2010 by selling hair ties door-to-door. Literally just hustle in a dream. Kitsch is self-funded, female-founded, and now carried in over 20,000 retail locations. Kitsch's best sellers include the satin pillowcases, caps, and eye masks. The satin is vegan and cruelty-free, not like silk, which was made from silkworms. They are so great for your hair and for your skin while you sleep. And I have put mine on my little memory foam, and it's not it's just very soft on my face, and I've noticed my hair is less frizzy when I wake up. I am currently wearing my satin scrunchie in my hair right now. I put my hair up in it every night, and it helps my hair stay like if I have styled it the day before it keeps it because it doesn't get all frizzy and sweaty while i sleep it has become a game changer Mm -hmm. they also offer heatless satin curling rollers another game changer you say bye-bye to heat damage there are tiktok videos of people throwing away their 600 hundred dollar curlers for this i have used this many times It lasts longer than any blowout or curling my own hair myself can do it's Honestly, it's magical. I don't understand it. But we were talking about how sometimes you just got to go back to how things were. And like back in the Mordecai days, people used like stuff like this to roll their hair. They didn't have curling irons and stuff. So sometimes you go back to the OG way of doing stuff. That was the best way the whole way. The updated version of the OG with that satin. It's great. And they're the drying scrunchies. Kitsch is offering you 30% off your entire order at mykitsch.com slash sinister. That's right. 30% off anything and everything at mykitsch, spelled M-Y-K-I-T-S-C-H dot com slash sinister. One more time, mykitsch.com slash sinister for 30% off of your order. The television show Ghost Hunters, starring the brave folks of the Atlantic Paranormal Society, or TAPS, visited the building in 2003. Lead investigators Jason and Grant were excited to train newbies, Jen and Dustin, in the ultra-haunted mansion. The crew drove all the way down from Rhode Island in their reconfigured Roto-Rooter vans. In Raleigh, they had lunch, then met up with the local ghost hunters from haunted North Carolina. The TAPS crew loaded into the mansion telling cameras that they were ready to disprove and debunk claims of the paranormal. Then current museum educator Chandra Milliken served as TAPS's host. She told the team that several tours we heard the piano playing. Upon inspection, nobody else was down there. She took them around the house, showing them the restroom and saying, The bathroom here is actually where most of the activity occurs for me personally. Well, same. That's right. <laughs> I mean, all of us can relate to that living or not. You're in the bathroom. You hear a sound. You have to just be like, you know what? That was probably a ghost. That wasn't my intestines. I don't need to call my GI doctor. It's fine. It's fine. She let the team into the bathroom, telling them. This is where I've actually had an experience where my hair was lifted off my head. That's the only time I've actually had physical contact. And it was right here. Well, maybe she was sick. (laughs) <laughs> and she's the ghost is doing her a solid like we've all right? done for our friends in the past. She was like, I had some particularly nasty sandwich <laughs> at the diner up the road. Y'all didn't go there, did you? <laughs> uh Oh, foreshadowing. In addition to the mansion, she took them to the Andrew Johnson house saying, this is the creepy building. I like this one the least. It's more in here of just a feeling of like, get out. It sounds strange, but it's a male presence in here. And we, we got to go there. It was a tiny little room. Tiny little room. There's some debate over, you know, a lot of people claim that they have Andrew Johnson's birthplace. 
Yes. I think you're only and born it, in one place. So I'm not here <laughs> to say who has it and who doesn't. I'll, they, uh, the Mordecai Park says that most of it has been rebuilt. I said, mm -hmm. is any of this original wood? And Jordan said, in that one corner, there's a couple of original planks, but most of it had all been reconstructed. And like re, uh, when it got moved and they update it, you get a little bit of a ship of Theseus, right? Of like, yeah. is it then? It's not on the same ground that it happened on. Right. And it's not the same wood that it happened in. But it is still an interesting piece of history to see how many people, it was multiple kids living in what was essentially a single room mm -hmm. with a fireplace on one end and then a ladder up to a loft above. And that is just too And when many we say people. ladder, um, that ladder was not something anybody should climb on. No, and in fact, we were not allowed to no, climb on no. it. No, <laughs> no. But if that is what it was like for children, yeah. I don't know. You just stay either up or down. You can't climb up or down that thing. Or you know what? You fell, that broke their arm, and they're like, well, the doctor learned medicine from his dad who learned it from his dad. So they're sort of, it's a shot in the there dark. Go. Good luck, That's kid. True. Like, you're, you might not make it out of it. We learned a lot about the history of Andrew Johnson while we were there in that house. We did. And about how he uh, was drunk at his inauguration, <laughs> which I did not know about until there. Uh, but then also that the Ghost Guild... The, that we were there with had d d done the EVP in there where they had asked, what's your favorite thing? And the reply was the sound of a child's voice mm. humming or singing. No one likes to hear that unless you can see the child that's doing it. <laughs> Even then. Even oh, okay. then, sometimes you're not nah. into it. Yeah. But especially when there's no one around and you hear it. Nope. Shut it down. After the TAPS crew set up and prepared to begin the investigation, Newbie Jen fell ill with nausea and stomach pains. Soon, Jason and Grant were taken out as well. Grant told cameras, I'm not feeling well at all, but I don't think it's anything paranormal. I think it's called buffalo chicken sandwich. Well, is it? Or is it? Mary Mordecai in there like, you bitches said that you were here to debunk stuff. Guess what? <laughs> now you got food poisoning. Get out. <laughs> debunk this. Diarrhea. <laughs> The TAPS crew packed up their equipment and left without conducting the promised investigation. Instead, they set their sights on the USS North Carolina ship docked in the nearby harbor. Raleigh News and Observer's reporter Josh Schaefer took issue with the hunter's sudden departure, writing, This is sort of thrill-seeking, bumbling, half-witted grope in the dark that makes specter searching the butt of jokes. It is rude to say we're going to investigate this one place— I get it. You get sick. You got to leave. But then you just come back to that same place. You don't pick up and move to another haunted location. You dance with the person that brought you. Yeah, that's exactly right. I And especially as a viewer of this show, when I like get my little notebook out, I'm like, okay, I'm ready to watch this thing. And I'm like, I can't wait to see what ghosts they have. And then they go and they're like, oh, I have diarrhea. <laughs> and they left. And I was like, oh, okay, well, maybe they'll come back. Nope. They're like, anyway, here's a boat. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> Great. Okay. Fascinating cool. story on the boat. But what about I the wanted... Mordecai house ghost? So that's what we tuned in to see. Yeah, it was a little bait and switchy. I felt it was yeah, bait and yeah. Switchy. I get it. You had the footage and you're like, we don't know, but don't make it a half and half episode. Yeah. Like you said, then go back and then maybe you can, uh, don't, I mean, don't go back to the restaurant wherever you ate. Don't eat the <laughs> buffalo chicken sandwich. But I was uh, disappointed. But I love that Josh Schaefer with the News and Observer was like, listen here, mm -hmm. you out of town carpetbaggers <laughs> coming down. Here. Yeah. Uh, he it was bumbling. <laughs> Nelson did tell us though that the USS North Carolina is very haunted and yes. has invited us to ghost hunt it with Let's him next time we were there, and we are very excited about that. We're going back. Jim Hall, a member of seven paranormal researchers, told reporters at the News and Observer he did not doubt the multitude of reports from witnesses who had encounters, saying. None of the witnesses seem to have any ulterior motive for their reports, and none sought to profit from them. If Mary is haunting Mordecai House, and the objective scientist in me demands that I say if, I certainly don't think she's dangerous or malevolent in any way. She seems to simply want attention. Which is very, it's me as a ghost, honestly, <laughs> of just like, hey, 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 pay attention to me. But also, you're like, if you get challenged or somebody talks shit, then you're like, guess what? You don't get to see this now. Bye. Nope, I would hide. 
I would hide. I would love it. I would love every minute of their frustration. <laughs> but like I'm right poison here, their but chicken they can't sandwich. see it. Yeah, yeah. She was buying that chicken sandwich. <laughs> In addition to the main Mordecai house, the cabin that once housed President Andrew Johnson has also played host to spirits throughout the decades. Author Nancy Roberts wrote in her book, Haunted Houses, that visitors passing by the Johnson house have reported seeing lit candles floating in the windows with no human hands holding them. Roberts is an expert on paranormal activity, having written extensively on the subject. She told Raleigh reporters in 1988 of her unusual career. I'm one of the few normal people who do this sort of thing. I'm not a nut. (laughs) She's like, I have one more comment I'd like to make to the newspaper. Also, if you're writing an extensive number of books on haunted houses, lean in, man. Yeah. Lean in. Who's to say who's a nut and who's not? Aren't we all nuts on this tree of life? You know? (laughs) <laughs> Who who's how is she any less nutty than anyone else in her field? I think if you're saying you're not a nut, that makes you nuttier. You doth uh, protest too much. <laughs> Nancy, what was her name? Nancy, Nancy Roberts. Nancy Roberts. Nancy, Nancy Roberts. Oh man, she uh yeah, girl, lean it. Nancy on. Nut Roberts. Nuts. That should be your new name. Nancy Nut <laughs> Roberts. Nut Nutty Nutty Roberts. Nutsy. Nutsy Roberts. <laughs> No, I love, I, uh, <laughs> I love that. Aren't we all nuts on this tree of life? I'm thinking I'm going to be thinking about that for a while. Well, it'll go on our quotes for this week, probably. That's right. Making, making it, uh, making it onto the quotes. That's how you, that's immortal right there. Nelson told us that a lot of the um, reports that they would get from the home were from people standing in windows, but because the Mordecai house has like this, protective film over the windows so um sunlight and stuff doesn't damage the things inside of it that it kind of creates this reflective um distorted look from the outside and he said every time that somebody's reported something we've been able to like chalk it up to just the way like things are reflecting off of this but if you don't know that and you're Mm -hmm. walking by and you you know see something what looks like a candle just kind of floating in the window you might think, or maybe that's, maybe it really is. Who's, who's to say? Andrew Johnson got up in the middle of the night to go pee and he's got the <laughs> candle, but you can't see him because he's a ghost. Yes, all you see is this little candle. Dr. Douglas R. Porter Jr., historic site manager for the city of Raleigh, told PBS NC. We're known to be one of the most haunted locations in North Carolina. Investigators from the National Society of Paranormal Investigation and Research, Inc., or INSPIRE, concurred when they conducted a sweep of the place in 2010. Inspire rejects being called ghost hunters because, according to team member George Mathis, We don't catch anything. Damn. Damn, that's That's true. Yeah. Don't be a hunter. Be a... Uh, investigator. investigator, a researcher. Yeah. Yeah. You're not trying... If you're you're hunting something, that implies you're also trying to catch it. Mm -hmm. Or kill it. Yeah. And we're not trying to do either of those things. No, let them be, because we've if the Ghostbusters taught us anything. You cannot contain ghosts. Mm-mm. Well, you can. You just can't shut off the breaker. Yeah, stuff's going to go real bad. Regarding whether ghosts are real, Mathis told the Raleigh News, I do believe something else is out there. I just don't know what it is. His fellow teammate, Tommy Benson, told reporters, There's a positive energy around the Mordecai house. Inspire teamed up with Raleigh's ghost group for a 2010 investigation. They made it clear that their investigation was all business, with the motto, No Ouija, no tarot, no confrontations. That's, I live my life inverted. All Ouija, all, <laughs> all terror, all Ouija, only all confrontations. <laughs> <laughs> only confrontations. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I'm not allowed on the ghost group team. Inspires Benson had an experience in the mansion, feeling a temperature drop in correlation with an EMF reader that went off the charts. Mathis was physically pushed in the mansion's basement. Reporters asked whether the team felt disappointed when no major paranormal activity happens. But Benson reasoned, It's not up to us. It's up to what's there. See, there's that. Don't don't try to beef with Mary Mordecai. Mm-mm. Just be like, if she's into it, she's into it. If not, that's fine too. These ghosts are entities. And they have their own. We got to ask for their consent before making them appear on our footage. Be respectful. So- it's like Bigfoot. If they don't, can I take a photo? And if they're like, not today, you got to be like, okay, that's fine. New theory, 
what if the original team that got food poisoning really because they were like we're gonna debunk this mary was like guess what now you bitches aren't getting shit instead because they were like well we're not getting anything here they feigned the food poisoning to literally jump ship so then they could change their whole game plan see i think that was what the journalist josh schaefer was getting at when he said this is kind of a grope in the dark because and that makes the paranormal investigation look silly because you take your toy and go home mm-hmm. when it doesn't go the way that you want it to go. And I imagine if you are, if you're conducting a paranormal investigation, and that's what I love about this mansion and kind of delving now into this more independent paranormal societies that have formed and understanding that they, while they share their information with other investigators and they'll share it with the public online or share it with us or whatever, that they are not having to perform for a TV show every week. So it's not like, okay, well, every single time we go in there or the one single time we go in there has to be. Oh, that's a really good point. Yeah. Because and so oh, I don't know. I feel kind of bad. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Don't don't you? Okay, let's go. Mm -hmm. Granted, maybe maybe they all did have food poisoning, but it's quite convenient to be like, I don't know. I'm not really picking anything up. Well, we can't just leave. Well, just tell them, tell me you have diarrhea. Yeah. Okay, it's I'll hard talk. to argue with diarrhea. <laughs> you know, I mean, who amongst us True. hasn't used the excuse? I have diarrhea to get out of something we didn't want to do so much. <laughs> I mean, honestly, too, it's not an excuse. It's just what's happening with me. <laughs> it's usually just that's your life. <laughs> it's an explanation, not an excuse. <laughs> Later that night on a haunted trolley tour, the team conducted an EVP session. When they allowed trolley passengers to ask questions, one guest asked, Is now a bad time for you to entertain company? When the team reviewed the EVP recording later, it provided a simple answer. No. (laughs) (laughs) And then I imagine some creepy vaudevillian music kicked in in the back on on the trolley. And that trolley just started going. You're like, wait, this isn't on the trolley track. No one's ever seen that trolley again. Ooh, They're all being entertained Wonka. somewhere. Mm-hmm. No one knows which way <laughs> we're going. going. It's one of that, that scene scared the shit out of me when I was a kid. I think, isn't it true that the kids didn't know that that's what was going to happen and their looks of terror on their face Ooh, is real? Well, that, think that... Make, would make sense because everyone does look genuinely freaked out. <laughs> like, what the fuck is Gene Wilder <laughs> doing right now? I thought he was cool. And he's like, oh, yeah. I think, too, he, they didn't tell him he was... He had never met them when he came out at the beginning and like fell down oh, and really? then flips. And that's why everyone's kind of like looking around and is kind of confused. Oh, Man, I Gene didn't Wilder. know that. Oh, he was a wild Genius. one. Genius. Wild one. Gene Wilder. Gene Wilder. Yeah. Horny as fuck. Really? I told you. I So I got into maybe summer of 2018. I got very into autobiographies. I genuine. I generally like memoir. I generally like nonfiction. But I was like started... Audible listening to a lot of celebrity autobiographies and so it was famous people and one of them of course in my you know the audio book or not the audio book but the um, the section you know when I'm Mm -hmm. like scrolling through to the app to like find a new one it was like you may also like this celebrity and one of them was Gene Wilder and he was a dude Gene Wilder fuck really was he married Oh, I mean, it was throughout his whole life. Like, he had these stories of, an, of his youth. He loved his wife, Gilda. Loved, I mean, they were like true love. But he I, he was a passionate lover. Nice. That, like, y- you don't look at Gene Wilder and be like, okay. Or maybe you do. Like, maybe uh, I've been sleeping on Gene Wilder. Yeah. But reading it, I was like, this is, I got to turn this off. This is too, <laughs> oh, it's okay. too horny, Gene Wilder. I was like, he is doing some things. Mm. It was some stuff. Do you know well, what? He's though? horny you in Young Frankenstein. That's true. That's true. That he's a much leading of a stretch. Man. Yeah. No. Yeah, we'll oh, roll I the love Gene Wilder. I hope oh. there's not a reason we shouldn't because, and if not there is, I don't know about it. But from everything I know, I love. I think he's was a fantastic actor. He was a comedic genius. And mm-hmm. Young Frankenstein. God damn. So yeah, good. that's enough for him to be hot, right? Is like a very funny leading man. But then you find out. Okay. All right. I get it. I think. Because it's not just 
I get it. Now that you tell me that and I'm thinking about him and his roles and just like his demeanor he's and mannerisms, lover. I think he's he's definitely got swag. Yeah, mm-hmm. swag. That's a good way mm-hmm. to put it. Mm-hmm. I'm just thinking about horny Gene Wilder. <laughs> Same. We both are like, <laughs> okay, okay. All right. All right. <laughs> Haunted trolley tours and visits are an annual tradition at the Mordecai Place, along with many other period-specific events. For those who are opposed to the more macabre and the traditional trick-or-treating when in the Raleigh area, an ad for the Haunted Mordecai experience ran beside this alternative. Holy Ghost Weenie Roast, a safe alternative to trick-or-treating. Well, What's safer <laughs> than giving a kid a stick... With a weenie on the end and being like, go hold this over uh, that open flame over there. Go walk toward the fire. <laughs> with Good the luck. stick in your hand. And just when you get to the, 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 the fl- not just like a candle, when you get to the burning inferno, just hold this right <laughs> over it. And, and, you know, God forbid you go get a piece of uh, candy from your neighbor. Yeah, that's the devil. But the but go get near the fire. Put your wiener near the fire. It's fine. By the way, I do, watched the uh, what second to most. We're all caught up on the rehearsal, but I saw the part you were talking about where the woman's oh, like yeah. trying to convince Nathan Fielder that Halloween is all satanic. That woman. The whoa! Yikes! Yeah, if you're not watching the rehearsal on HBO Max, what are uh, you doing? Go watch. If you are able to watch the rehearsal, go watch it. Nathan Fielder. Fucking genius. He, But at the same time, I'm so conflicted by the psychological impacts that this show might be having on people that I don't know how to feel about things anymore. I'm I'm all tor- torn up about it. <laughs> I'm all torn up. <laughs> it is fascinating, the concept of reality and like what, what is real. And then if you, you're being told that something isn't real, does that, you know, like mm-hmm. what... Anyway, it, I could. It's a mind melt. Go, it's a, yes, a, we might have to fuck. just like do a Patreon discussion of the rehearsal <laughs> once it's all over or something. It's so good. But in one of the one of the players on the show mentioned, oh yeah, the devil or the Halloween is like it's a de- it's the devil's day, and he's like, did you where did you learn that? And she's like, well, you just have to know the right words to punch in. It's like okay, well yeah, that's the internet, yeah. right? If you know the right words to punch in, any stupid thing will come up to validate whatever you want to believe he says oh later in a later scene which is what i love about him is that he's so um you never really know how he feels about anything Mm -mm. because he's yeah it's just like there's zero expression registered on his face but at the same time you're like i feel like he's being a little sarcastic right now but also maybe not he's very hard to read and figure out Mm -hmm. which i told tommy i go i could never be in a relationship with him i would never know if i was getting like the truth or if you know what i mean it just seems so like mind games oh i mean i never could i i fell for i thought i had to send you a youtube video because i wasn't sure if it was real or fake (laughs) yesterday (laughs) Is this about the python? <laughs> yes, an anaconda. Oh, an anaconda. Found, That's what it was. There was a best of next door post that said, uh, I was walking my snake and it got loose. If anyone sees it, let me know. And then someone responded, is it an albino python? I think I saw it going after a cat. The cat got away, though. Don't know what happened to the python. And the person said, yes, that's it, except it's not a python. It's very (laughs) venomous. So we got to talking about whether or not you could walk a snake. And then I Googled snake on a leash. And this video on YouTube came up of a freaking humongous anaconda with a little leash around, not quite its neck, like a little bit further down, which I guess gives you a little wiggle room. If it starts to get loose, you can like jump into action. But at one point, (laughs) snake eat it. (laughs) It ate a whole person. <laughs> that was the CGI part of the video. <laughs> the rest and of it like, appeared very legitimate. And these people were walking. It had to have been seven, eight feet. Huge. I mean, and it was, it was, I, wild. It was uh, almost as big around as like a thigh, like a adult human thigh. It was thick. Sorry if you hear thunder. Oh, it's raining for the first yeah. time in what seems like years. I so. was uh, trying to be quiet because I was like, I'll just mute myself when Heather's talking. And I'm like, we live five minutes away from each other. <laughs> if it's happening in my house, it's also happening at her house. It so uh, there's going to be thunder that we cannot edit out of this. But everyone give a round of applause for Mother Nature because I believe it's been maybe over 50 days since we've had rain. It's been wild. It's been like a I long said, time. when I heard that noise earlier, I thought surely someone's starting a lawnmower. There's no way that that's thunder. That doesn't happen here. 
it's uh, been Just a minute, so we are we need it. So You give up on rain. Well, anyway, we saw a picture. I saw this video, and I could not figure out if it was real or fake, and I had to send it to you. <laughs> so if I was in a relationship with someone who was, like, constantly just deadpanning, yeah. I would just believe everything yeah. that they said. Yeah. Um, but, but he, he says to, to her, say. hey, I, um, I looked up uh, Halloween, like you said, and it says it's actually um, a Celtic and pagan tradition. And she goes, oh, no, you weren't Googling the right thing. Did you Google satanic traditions Halloween? And it's like, well, no, but if I had, of course you can find what you're looking for. So when you're only seeking out like that truth, that yeah. angle of something – you live in a bubble in an echo chamber, and it's just, I don't even remember what we were talking about. Trick-or-treating? Yeah, trick-or-treating. So trick-or-treating, the you, Holy Ghost weenie yeah, roast. If you aren't into that, just go to the Holy Ghost weenie roast, which, classic name, good <laughs> good job, whoever came up with that. They had a brainstorming session, mm-hmm. you know they did. Oh, for sure, yes, that was number one. Yeah, you can't top it. No, how are you going to, in fact, I think they were like, what can we do that rhymes with Holy Ghost? So then it's just like, well, it's got to be uh, Holy Ghost. Jam and toast. <laughs> oh, and that's good. And they're like, okay, we could do a breakfast, a breakfast theme uh, alternative to trick-or-treating. That's good. Holy Ghost. Weenie roast has got to win. See, we can't That's even it. come up jam with that. Jam and toast or jam weenie toast. roast. So that was it. You had to pick jam and toast or weenie roast. Which side are you on? And they, it's easier to make one big fire than to everyone bring a toaster. That's true. To toast the bread. <laughs> yeah, you got to have a lot of toasters. They didn't that. have enough outlets. <laughs> well, visitors interested in history and the paranormal visit the mansion each year. TripAdvisor users comment on the ghouls hanging around, with one user saying, Have fun, enjoy the stories, and get a little spooked. While another claimed her visit gave her an eerie feeling. Reviewer JWeezy25 caught some activity on camera, writing, We did get some interesting photographs that captured some strange phenomena outside the house, but the jury's still out for me. A one-star review complained that the 237-year-old mansion had Too many cobwebs. But other users recommended the Mordecai place more warmly. Bud H. wrote that. This is an excellent place to go as a couple. Mark W. went a step further, writing that the holiday celebration complete with old-timey Christmas carolers and the accompanying Civil War encampment reenactment in which... Local actresses and actresses in period costume talk about their situation and hardships made for a great date night. Mark. I'm not going to kink shame... But some things I feel just aren't. You're not. You're not trying to get all Gene Wilder about a uh, Civil Mm-mm. War re in reenactment, uh, especially their situation and hardships. Yeah. The situation horrifying hardships worse, I guess, because they're getting specific. Generally, the situation's a bummer. Specifically, the hardships, <laughs> and it's like, what else? Yeah, how else would was it? Was it like were your feet cold in those old boots? <laughs> <laughs> you're like, I don't know if I'm supposed to be talking just to you. Yeah, What's... is it like a immersive thing? Or are we just supposed to talk to each other and you guys watch? He's like, that's fine too. I'll watch. See, cool. adult, ver- you can we can say whatever we want. <laughs> that's right. It's after 10 p.m. You can say whatever the hell you want. Mm-hmm. I like to think that Bud H and Mark W were on this date together. Oh my God, love connection. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I love that. That was an excellent place to go as a couple. <laughs> hell yeah, it was. <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> The city also owns the land nearby the park that contains two natural water springs. Residents are prohibited from drinking from the springs as the water is unfiltered. Drinking from the springs is also ill-advised, given a five-star review of the park from a man named Glenn, who wrote, Quiet Saturday visit. Uh, The bathrooms were locked. Two springs very nearby. Glenn pissed in the spring. (laughs) Glenn... Which Come one? On. Who knows? So that's why you don't drink out of either because he didn't. Mm-mm. Maybe it was both. Maybe he. It was gotta, like a water hose. Just shoop, shoop, shoop. Did a little in one. Saved it. Mm-hmm. Pinched it off. Saved it. Walked over. Did the rest in the oh, other. Oh, that makes more sense. I was thinking they were right next to each other and he could just whip it back and forth. <laughs> but like that probably those, didn't work. Do you remember those back in the day? Did anybody in your neighborhood have a wooden cutout sprinkler that looked like a boy? And that you would put the hose in the 
penis area and then it would flip around. Did you have this? No. I've but never those... even seen this. Oh, that was a thing. I've never seen that. We have um one that like whips around but it's flowers. It's not a but I am now going to go on an Amazon hunt though for this other one. Yeah, this one it's not really in his crotch area. He's just holding it. The farmer is just holding it, but that was I distinctly remember that as a kid. I don't that remember that. A, it's like a wooden cutout, and you would put the hose. Somebody send us a DM so I know I'm not <laughs> losing it, but I don't think I made that up. Oh, you just found a picture, didn't you? Well, it was uh, the farmer's holding it in his hand, so uh, it wasn't. Okay. Uh, was it to filthy. water your lawn or to play in the sprinkler? Oh, man. I think it was to like water your lawn. People, people think a lot of things look good in their lawn. So you. <laughs> Would have to move it around the yard so all your yard your yard gets evenly watered. Well, I think that's the issue, not the issue, but the benefit of the <laughs> boy sprinkler was that <laughs> it would whip around in various directions. Oh, okay. That doesn't still it doesn't seem efficient though. No, but you know, I mean, I guess it's a more fun way than doing the one that just goes back and forth. If you want your neighbors to know that you care about the health of your lawn and that also you have no taste, you get that. <laughs> and that you you're that quirky, one. then yeah, you get like, the oh, sprinkler fun. boy. Mm-hmm. Sprinkler boy, it's fun. <laughs> it's like, no. Well, we had a wonderful time visiting everything. Uh, the The park is, is beautiful. There were people having lunch at picnic tables. There's... Um, they said they do, they've done weddings in the actual chapel there. There's, um, lo- lots of different, uh, buildings and stuff that you can visit on the tour. It was, it was all in all a very nice day. It was fantastic to visit. And there is a, a, a house, not a house, a, uh, center, like a visitor mm-hmm. center too, that you can go in and there's, uh, displays on the wall and explanations and they're adding new things to it as well. They've just added a new, I guess it was an office towards the back that it wasn't, we weren't able to tour it at the time, but it may in the future be open to tours, which would be fascinating to see like what somebody's law office would look like back in the day. Mm -hmm. There's also another law office that they moved to that area as well as the chapel and everything. So it's pretty, uh, it's a pretty swanky little place to go to. You got all these little, you brought together a village that you now can use it for, I'm sure a lot of school groups go, I mean, a lot of school groups go there to this like immersive history that you can read about something in a book, but then to go and hands on, be able to see it, touch it, be touched by it. Are the mm-hmm. ghosts there holding your hair back for your buffalo chicken sandwich? Um, but have that there. And I do appreciate a place that has a paranormal aspect to it that you could just try to brush it under the rug and be like, oh, I don't want to talk about the ghost thing, but takes it in a more serious fashion and is like, okay, well, let's pick somebody who's qualified to do this and actually do real investigations for two years since at a time and bring that into the holistic part of the history and the other, uh, like the telling everybody's story that yes. used to live there. Like they said, the Mordecais were highly outnumbered by the enslaved individuals that live with them and having tour guides that are not only familiar with their stories, but then are sharing those stories at the end, giving us, you know, the printouts that had full first person accounts of what it was like living under Henry Mordecai and some of the um, other owners. Then it gives a, it's literally history from that, those perspectives that are normally not highlighted so yeah and it's a when, great place. when that's ignored or just straight up uh left out that's when history gets warped and we start yeah. teaching other generations about a uh, history that wasn't factual or accurate yeah. and so it's great that they are really saying like we recognize both of these things and uh, aren't silencing uh, the voices of so many that have been silenced for so long. So super appreciated it. Super appreciate Nelson. They were great. We had a great time at the show. If you were there and you were part of the Judge Christie, man, what a heated debate we had about parking. We were asking whether you should back in or drive in front ways and I'm married to a perma backer. My husband backs into every parking spot. Tommy and Tommy switches it up. He does both. Depends. Yeah, depends on the situation, but 
man, there are some people that are staunchly backer uppers and you're not going to change their minds. I'm mostly a can, whatever's convenient. So if mm-hmm. it's like, oh, that's a spot and I can only get it by backing in, I do that. But I um, am married to a back earner where we get to a spot that would just be real easy to whip in. And he's like, <clears throat> put it in reverse. <laughs> and I was like, you know, back in this. I don't even ask anymore because yeah, now I know. You know it's but gonna happen. the audience was tearing one another asunder. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, the rivals of the, was it... It's Carolina versus State, I believe, were the two okay. it team or UNC got heated versus State. Yeah, and it was uh, down to because we had seen a bumper sticker depicting one a uh, uh, Carolina college printed fish eating another fish, and I was like, "Do they have competitive fishing?" And they do. Yeah, People we have found out they do. Link. Yes, yeah, they have competitive fishing. Because we were overall, what was the college we were staying by? We were by North Carolina State. Carol- Yes, Carolina State, the Wolfpack, home of the Wolf. It was NC State. Yeah, NC, NC State, State gorgeous campus. Yeah, very, 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 very nice. Raleigh in general was a wonderful city. I always wanted to go because I love David Sedaris, so I'm glad mm-hmm. we went. And we made the, uh, to anybody that's interested, if it tickles your fancy, there are a lot of hot guys jogging around. <laughs> Just Dude, throwing it out there. Dude, Raleigh, <laughs> what's up? There, yeah. I'll Nashville tell you too. what, Gene Wilder, all up all over the place in yeah. Raleigh. They had that swag. Dude, they're, yeah. We declared on this leg of the tour because it was Raleigh, Nashville, Nashville. Atlanta, that the South has some of the hottest guys. And I'm sorry, we've done our research. We've been all over. And this is what, Raleigh and Nashville, super hot guys. Yeah, Didn't we get were... to see a lot of Atlanta, so we, we were in and out of there. But Raleigh, Nashville, y'all got it on lock. So Congrats. good for you, and and there were a lot of good looking ladies too. So oh yeah, you know a, just people all, all in over. general, all over. And a hoop meet and everybody. Thanks to everybody that came to the show. Sorry that we don't have the audio for you, but we yeah. have this instead. Yes. Well, if you are there and you want to visit the Mordecai House, it's a favorite spot for historians and school field trips. The well-kept landscape grounds make a perfect spot for a picnic lunch or a casual stroll. Seemingly a hotbed of paranormal activity, the Mordecai House also ranks among the top destinations for ghost hunting. The house itself in the entire city of Oaks is a beautiful destination for a thrilling and chilling taste of history. Just be careful you don't get too attached to the place. Or, much like Mary Mordecai, you may end up sticking around the lush scenery forever. <laughs> and if you want to experience the Mordecai House's history, head out to the 50th anniversary celebration of Mordecai Historic Park on August 12th. That's just in a few days. And check out the house's haunts at the annual Haunted Festival on October 29th. And if you do that, then you stay two days, go to the cemetery, yes. midnight, watch the head spin around. Make it a whole Although, make it a whole Halloween weekend. Midnight on Halloween. Do you think that means... 11.59 p.m. on October 30th into 31st? Or do you think that means Halloween night, 11.59 October 31st into 12 o'clock November 1st? Before I answer this, I just want to say that trying to figure out when midnight is is one of the biggest stressors of my life. Yeah. Whenever I have to schedule the episodes to upload and you... And I, uh, we always schedule them for midnight. I have to always figure out, and I do it by New Year's Eve. I think New Year's Eve, we all celebrate it when it turns midnight going into the first. Okay. So to me, the head is going to spin at midnight on, wait, on October 31st, right? Well, that's that's my question. So that's when it would be, because if New Year's is, Eve is midnight, if the if shit if New Year's if you say Happy New Year at midnight yes. on December thirty first, then head spins midnight October thirty first. Well, but what it is is so the ten nine eight the countdown. Is eleven fifty nine p.m. on twelve thirty one, yeah, and then midnight is That's midnight true. Okay. on the first, yeah. 
So are this you is saying- why it's a stressor is because I don't fucking know, understand time. First of all, it's all made up. So who cares? The head can spin at any time at once as far as I'm concerned. I can tell I really picked a nerve. <laughs> I'm not mad. It's, not really mad legitimately, like, it. it's a legitimate stressor for me <laughs> so, that I don't yeah. understand when it is. You said when you taught at SMU and yes, y'all we would had to say tell. like, okay, everybody needs to turn in their stuff by midnight. People no, I would say 11.59. I, I, I always said 11.59 because when the other professor would say midnight, I would get, I because I was like the associate professor, I was like the underling, so I had to get all the damn emails from the students. And a, a class of 15 students, I'd probably get 11 emails that are like, did you mean 11.59 on the 31st or midnight on the 1st? Mm-hmm. Or did you mean 11.59 on the f-? And I was just like, listen, man. Or I was like, we're going to do 10 p.m. It's due at 10 p.m. on this day. What do you need those extra two hours for? Go to bed. It's due at 10 p.m. You know what? I wonder if that's why Patreon defaults to 11.59 because it knows you're, you're going to get confused if you try and do this at midnight. So just upload it at 11.59. Yeah, it's probably like, do you mean this? The same uh, Squarespace does that one because we mm. upload our uh, show mm-hmm. notes. I have them. I set them to upload exactly. And I have to go to the day that I want to do it at and either go all the way down to zero or go the day before and go all the way up to 1159. So like Tuesday, August 9th, I would do it at 1159 on Tuesday, August 9th. So it would be midnight on the 10th. God. Yeah, it's fucked up. My head it's hurts now. Up. Yeah, time sucks. Time sucks. <laughs> time sucks. <laughs> well, whatever. You know what? The only way you can figure it out is you gotta just stay there for like five minutes. So you can. <laughs> is it at eleven fifty nine? Is it at midnight? None of us know. So uh, go also, check it out. Daylight and- savings was the ghost. Do they oh, know daylight damn. savings? Time zones. It's all made up. Yeah, it's all made up. It's all made up. It is. It is all made up. Well, if you were there, thank you so much for coming to the show. Um, thank you to Good Night's Comedy Club. Great space. Last uh, time we probably will do a show there because they were about to move into a new location. That's right. But um, also huge thanks to the Ghost Guild and a special thank you to Sunday Salon and the owner, Lisa. She is a listener and reached out to us before and said, I'd love to make y'all's hair look beautiful before your show. Cute, beautiful salon in Cary, North Carolina, and this very cute little shopping center. So if you're in the area, make sure you go check them out because they did a wonderful job. Heather. Yes. We didn't say, so what do we think? But we already said, said, so what do we think? Yeah, they put everyone's shit there so they go show up. That's how it works. And yeah. But now, what do we think about... Some upcoming shows that you have. Well, Patreon has been a flutter because of your oh, man. video of you doing a presentation you never seen before. You had a character of you were going to be a motivational speaker. Mm-hmm. This was a Dallas Comedy Club. A, a Dallas Comedy ago. Club. A few, yeah, two months ago, and I filmed it for you. And uh, we, I created a slideshow. So the premise is called People Presenting Things. And normally it's just random whoever wants to submit a slideshow. But when you agreed to do the show, I begged to be able to make your slideshow. <laughs> yes. And so and that I you did. did. And I made it with your worst nightmare. And so it's just a solid 13 minute video of you. The first few minutes are fine because there's no photos. But once the pictures start, boy, they don't stop. And your reaction is fantastic. And uh, unfortunately, the audio is just uh, me laughing. So you you hear no, you, No, I obviously. think you can hear me. I watched oh, the whole no, thing. I think it sounds great. No, it sounds great. You can hear you. But you will hear, <laughs> and it's me in the background. Because uh, I would know when the yes. worst pictures were about to come up. So in uh, revenge, I mean, uh, in return... <laughs> You are now have made a slideshow for me. Will it, make I am making it. Uh oh, got a slideshow coming. So this Thursday, August eleventh at nine p.m., it will be my turn. I have some character ideas I'm thinking about. I haven't landed on one. I'm down to two. Okay, uh, depending on costuming, but I will be a character, and then I will do a presentation I've never seen before and perform it at Dallas Comedy Club. PowerPoint presentation, yeah. Yes. I get a, do I, I get a clicker? I get to click through. Yeah, yeah, you do get a clicker. So if you want to check that out, uh, tickets are available on our uh, website. Uh, you can go to sinisterhood.com slash live shows and the information will be there. And then the next night you also have a show at Dallas Comedy Club. On August 12th at 8 p.m., I'm doing Dr. Frankenstein's 
How I Learned to Stop. It's a really long title, but it has Frankenstein <laughs> in it. So if you see Frankenstein, that's me. Uh, the idea is that two person duos are matched up and that we do uh, a scene together where it's just the two of us. And then at the end, we all mix it up together. And my uh, old comedy pal, Adam Fullerton, we used to do a improvised morning show. That's great. Uh, a couple of years ago. Thank you. We had so much fun doing it. He moved off to Cleveland. Well, he has moved back and we are reuniting for uh, this. And then also in the rest of the cast is some other uh, pals we've done comedy with before. So it's a little watermelon reunion. I so might come to this. You should come. It'll be fun. It'll be yeah. Jamie and Frank are going to be in it. I think I might come to this. Liam was like, should I come to one or the other? I said, well, I would say both. <laughs> Let's do both because then I'll have someone to sit with. Oh, there you go. I mean, yeah, I'm, in Paris. I may have. Oh, Paris is going. I'll already have yeah. somebody to sit with. So there you go. Or uh, you guys come. Introduce yourself. We Christy can all has sit someone together. To yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then you can. You uh, say at a place where we perform. Yeah. Frequently. <laughs> I, I will know someone to sit with. Yes. It was silly of me to think that I'm going to walk into a comedy club where I perform regularly and not know and anyone. Not know anyone. But so it, it's any of that, sinisterhood.com slash live shows. The tickets are there and we'll see you there. It'll be super fun. Mm-hmm. Hopefully uh, it will. Uh, it's late at night, so it won't be that hot. It'll be great. They have no. air conditioning and beer inside. So yes. It's fine. And a lovely patio because at night, if you're sitting still, you can you can tolerate it outside. Yeah, you can. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we love providing Sinisterhood to you at no cost. So if you like what you hear, consider supporting the show by donating to our Patreon. We're a small operation, creating the show for you by researching, writing, recording, and producing it ourselves. Any amount is sincerely appreciated and helps offset the cost of making and hosting the show. As a thank you, you'll also get some sweet perks like ad-free episodes, a Sinisterhood sticker, membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group for those in the Ruling the Airwaves and Getting Into It tier, a special shout-out on the show, a monthly bonus mini-sode. This past month was an Ezra Miller episode where we discussed the actor's issues that they've had with the law, and there's even more stuff has come out since that one, so we may have to cover it some more in the future. We also have Patreon-exclusive video and audio content, including Am I the Asshole, Relationship Advice, Judge Christie, Dear Sinister, True Crime Headlines, and so much more. And patrons in the Getting Into It tier are also able to vote on a bonus content segment each month that they would like to see us live stream. You also have the fun perk of access to our Discord server, where you can connect with other fans in real time and discuss the latest in true crime, share personal ghost stories, or just post adorable pictures of your pets. We hop on occasionally, and we host monthly Q&As on Crowdcast, where you can ask us all your burning questions. For patrons not in the U.S., you have the option to pay in pounds or euros, saving you the cost of the conversion fee. Annual memberships for all tiers are also now available. Those that select this option will be rewarded with a free month of membership. For more details on all of this and specific member tiers, visit SinisterHood.com and click Patreon on the top banner. And make sure you stick around after our sign-offs to hear your shout-outs. So many of you have been tagging us in pictures of you sporting your sweet Sinisterhood merch. Keep those pictures coming. Uh, my husband, I'll, he bought a shirt off of the website, Aww. so I'll take a photo of him in it. <laughs> Which one get did he some, get? Um, he got the, I think he got the Keep It Creepy one. He was between um, the So What Do We Think and the Keep It Creepy with the Ghost. Nice. I think that that one is a women's cut shirt, but he does. He's it's an everybody cut shirt. Yeah. He's going to look great in it. He looks great. If you want some cool Sinisterhood swag, just like Paris Brown has, <laughs> T-shirts, mugs, totes, and even clothes for your kiddos, visit Sinisterhood.com and click shop on the top banner. The best thing you can do to help us grow is like, review, and follow on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast. And please tell a friend who you think would like us to check us out. You can also share any episode by clicking the three dots in the top right corner and share topic-based playlists from Spotify by visiting Sinisterhood.com slash playlist. All of this means so much to us and really helps podcasts like us get more exposure. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod. Like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood. We have TikTok, YouTube. Christy, where are you at on the computer? I am on Instagram at Christy M. Wallace and on TikTok and Twitter at Christy or GTFO. Heather? I'm on Twitter at MCK versus the world and on TikTok and Instagram at Heather versus the world. As always, the devil rules the airwaves. Keep it creepy. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for supporting the show on Patreon. Here are your special Patreon shout outs. Fran Corsioni. Alyssa Hernandez. Helen Hilton. Kendall Young. Megan Connor. Joanna. Cassie. Allie Tamez. 
Mariah Callahan. The Daddy Mothman. Brr. Amber Chitwood. Sabrina Catley. Amanda Kay. Heather McBride. Caitlin Evans. Paige Tranchida. Nicholas R. Bitten. Destiny Hogan. Shannon Brown. Megan Manning. Nicole Chisholm. Tracy Anderson. Samantha Yanucci. Brandy Warner. Katie Davis. Madeline Carroll. Ruth Twing. Whitney Lee. Leany. Jennifer Jarrett. Britt Tanny. Haley Sparks. Krista Duff. Molly O'Neill. Allie Cox. Joyce Campbell. Jesse Lewis. Thank you so much for supporting the show. We could not do this without you. We hope we pronounced your names correctly. We love you so much. Stay safe, stay healthy, and keep it creepy. Bwahaha. <laughs> Sin